My name is Henrik Plater. I'm a security researcher at Endor Labs. And with me, I have John Meadows from City. Hello, everyone. I'm John Meadows, a tech fellow at City, and I'm responsible for uh, a lot of the engineering work we have at City, including supply chain and open source uh, security. Thank you so much for joining us. This session will be about the top 10 open source security risks 2023. This is something that everybody consuming open source software during software development should know about. We start with a very quick introduction on why this matters, why this is important at all. And we will brush very quickly over it because we all know how important open source software is these days. So it is eating, software is eating the world, but open source is eating software. These are two statistics. The one is from a paper published in 2021 showing that 86% of around about 7,000 commercial applications were coming from open source software projects, while 14, roughly 14% 14 was just yeah, proprietary developed for this specific purpose of the application. So this is on the granularity of dependencies and a comparable chart um, is shown below. This is a study that we have done earlier this year, computed on the granularity of lines of code. We looked at 3000 something census two packages and we found that more than 1380 or 1380 packages exactly have 90% or more open source lines of code included. And as you all know, open source licenses typically exclude any warranty and liabil liability. And, and so it's all on the consumers basically to deal with and assume the risks coming with the consumption. One of the obvious questions is why do we need another list? We've got, we've got a lot of security lists and compliance lists we try to adhere to. Key one being the OSP top 10, which is a great list uh, from a security software perspective, showing you what to look for in your source, co source code and such. Now, one of the things that we, we thought about though is, is actually when we look at open source software specifically, there is a lot of material, um, a lot of rigor that we need to bring to the table when we start to look at dependencies. And we've really discovered that due to some of the issues that can be brought in from dependencies, it really needs a, a more detailed look, a, a real look at, at the dependency management practice around that. So that's why we started to look at the different attacks that can be aimed at uh, open source software and how we would look at the operational and the security risks specifically in that area. So it really expands that one item from the OWASP top 10 into sort of the wider groups of mitigations that you can put in place for that. But what do we mean by the OSS uh, open source dependencies? And I think that's important just to quickly cover. It's really looking at any of the open source software that's developed or managed by third parties and pulled in to your SDLC when you execute it. And it also looks at some of the third party uh, scripts and snippets of code as well, because it's really anything that you ingest into your uh, software as you build it. And that's the real important piece, what you're ingesting into your supply chain at the front, because that's where we've discovered there are a lot of attacks that you can mitigate. It's really that sweet spot that you can focus on, particularly with the list that we've provided. And so in order to support, let's say, an dependency, open source dependency management, risk management. We came up with 10 open source security risks, open source software risks, sorry. And this list has been selected, ordered according to priority and described in collaboration with 20, more than 20 CISOs and CTOs. Every risks, risk comes with a description. It comes with example incidents or issues, as well as actions to be taken in order to reduce the respective risks, uh, risk. And uh, so here you have the, the complete list of 10. You can download this list and read through it in more detail on, our, on, on the website. But for um, uh, due to a lack of time, we will just dive into the first two of them in uh, a little bit more detail in the following slides. So the first one is known vulnerabilities, and this is 
probably the one that a lot of people are already working on, hopefully. It's really looking at vulnerabilities in open source software and what we should do about them. Since way back in Heartbleed, there's been lots of conversations about how to address some of the vulnerabilities in open source projects. And the main thing is really to try to update to a later version. But what we really want to do as well is just show really the life cycle of vulnerability, just to really bring that home. And I think that's it's really important when we look at mitigating some of these vulnerabilities. If you think about it, <clears throat> as people are developing open source software, it really starts with a, an accidental introduction of a security issue or a vulnerability. So right at the start of the, the process, really, you'd have that accidental introduction. Um, there's usually a fairly significant gap between that and when it's publicly disclosed that there is an issue. Um, and then there's a CVE that gets raised, hopefully before that, um, but not necessarily always that patch will be raised. And then we can start to, to move up to the latest version of the software. However, what we're seeing is that the time gap between the, the CVE being made available and dis discovered and the time between the patch is really shrinking. So we're seeing attackers in the industry really starting to accelerate and get some of those exploits out much faster, which means it's much more important for us in the industry to update faster to more non-vulnerable versions of that software. And I think it's actually one of the open statements in the recent Sonatype state of supply chain document that suggests that at the moment, about 96% of software that has a vulnerability in it, people are still pulling down the vulnerable version rather than the, the one that has been patched. So that's something that we do need to address and get, get the latest version of the patched software much faster. But that's the vulnerabilities, right? What about the actions? What do we need to take? What actions do we need to take? Now, if we look at it, a lot of the, the sort of approaches are around scanning regularly for fixes and known vulnerabilities in the open source. And often we get into a, a situation where we're chasing around the, the wheel, trying to patch and update as quickly as possible and looking for the latest version of that non-patched software. But the sort of common thinking around this is starting to evolve a little bit. As we start to look at these vulnerabilities in the, in the industry, there's a realization that actually not all of the vulnerabilities are readily exploitable. So additional techniques have started to come to the fore, such as EPSS and the potential probability score on whether that's going to be exploitable. So maybe bringing that into the vulnerability management program to, to look at prioritizing vulnerabilities that are more likely to be exploitable. But also a couple of other suggestion, suggested actions here as well, really looking at adding a context-specific criteria to the vulnerability management program, thinking through where that vulnerability is uh, deployed. Is it on an internet-reachable device, in which case you, you need to fix it very quickly, that's a clear avenue for attack, or is it elsewhere within the architecture with multiple mitigations in place that mitigate the chances of that attack happening? And I think this is a way that we've reviewed to suggest that there's a way of prioritizing some of these vulnerabilities so you're not always stuck in the wheel. And if the context where that application is deployed as such, you could perhaps look at it differently. The final one here is around code reachability. And this is an approach where we, we look at the open source libraries that are referenced in the dependency tree and, and realize that actually, not all of that open source software is loaded into memory for one, and not all of it is reached by the code that we've uh, written to call that dependency. So it significantly reduces the chance of an exploit being, being exploited if we're not loading it into memory and we're not actually calling it directly. So that's definitely an area of focus where you could ostensibly reduce the number of vulnerabilities that you're going after immediately and prioritizing those that are, are reachable and upfront. So Henrik, maybe you can give us a little more information in, in code reachability itself. Yes. So one of the um, things you will need to do uh, when being swamped by vulnerabilities is to try to assess their impact. Do they really matter in your context? And as John mentioned, not all the code that you import in your 
dependencies is in fact used by your application. And so the question, is this reached, is this, which is a prerequisite for being exploitable in the first place, is something that cannot be answered by dependency graphs. So what we see here is an example dependency graph from a Maven plugin. You have the application at the very top, at the root of that tree. You have then a layer of direct dependencies right below, and then you have many transitive dependencies. And suppose there is a vulnerability in any of those transitive dependencies deep down. Assessing the impact and the relevancy of this vulnerability is very hard for the developer who is working on that application. He may have never heard about this dependency. It is pulled in transitively let alone knowing about which functions are used or not used. And also function invocations happening between the code in those dependencies does not follow the edges of the dependency graph. They can basically be different from the directed edges of this dependency graph. And the solution to this problem is yeah, program analysis and what we at Endor Labs do in particular is call graph analysis, which is basically opening those black boxes, those dependencies, and we look at the granularity of functions. And so one of the kind of techniques is to construct call graphs. And what you see here is a relatively simple call graph that we have constructed for a component, a logging component called logback access version 146. It is comprising roughly 14,000 nodes and 60,000 edges. Every node of that graph is representing a function either in the application in the client code, which is logback access, slightly bigger in green, or a function in any of the dependencies. On the top left, for example, all those dark reddish nodes, they are part of a dependency of logback access, an optional dependency, which is called Tomcat Coyote. And as we will see, those call graphs are a powerful tool for accomplishing a number of things. The before mentioned reachability analysis, but you can also use it, in fact, to produce those numbers that I have shown in the very beginning of the presentation. What is the ratio of internal code versus external code? You could look for change impact analysis because these are the functions that I invoke. And so if you update a dependency, you should make sure that those dependence, that those functions you call into are still present in the new version, or otherwise you need to change your client code. All those nodes and edges are annotated with additional metadata, such as the Java signatures, function signatures, such as the Java artifact, Maven artifact, they were loaded from, and those that relate to vulnerabilities are annotated with the vulnerability identifier and CVSS scores. And those annotations allow us to drill down and look into specific aspects. And so I one, one of that is um, this example, better understanding the invocation or the relevancy of a vulnerability uh, with a given identifier here. This is um, related to the way how Jetty passed cookies. And we see from um, after having removed all the other and edges and nodes that the vulnerable code is pretty straightforwardly called by the client code. Again, client code is on the top. There are different green nodes belonging to logback access. And just with three hops, we go through another component, the Jetty server, to the vulnerable function in the component Jetty HTTP, the vulnerable function being named cookie, cookie cutter pass fields. And so you see by removing all those edges, we can focus on the analysis of a given vulnerability, which is first of all evidence to the developer that this vulnerable code and this vulnerability really matters in his context. And secondly, it could also help to basically solve the issue to develop, for example, custom mitigations. Suppose if the Jetty HTTP component cannot be updated for whatever reasons, maybe there is no fix yet, or there are some other conflicts. 
So that concludes the deep dive into core graphs and how they support vulnerability assessments. The next one up is a compromise of legitimate package. This is different from some of the other approaches you might see where malicious open source libraries could be deployed via typo squatting and such, where there's different name given to an open source package and you may inappropriately or incorrectly download that package. This is more focused on legitimate packages that have been deployed for a while. They're perhaps trusted packages that is already part of an organization. But then the developer, or, or rather the contributor of that software, was somehow compromised, or that package was leading to that compromise. So if you look at this in a little bit more detail, what, what's really happening here is the supply chain of that open source pr product has been compromised in some way. It could be right at source, where the source code for that open source project was affected, or the way that open source library was built got affected at that point. And that led, obviously, to that code directly being ingested by the end user and consumer and causing an issue. So there's a number of different actions we can take to mitigate that. But before we go into it, I do want to point out the difference between malicious and vulnerable software. These things are very different. So whereas vulnerable software that we were discussing in um, point one was really an issue that may have been exploitable and you can review using call reachability analysis, whether it was exploitable. And often it, it's truly problematic if it's in a production servo that can be reached, but there's certain mitigations you can put in place. We need to differentiate that from malicious open source software or rather malicious attacks on open source software. This is where an attacker gets in and implements a payload directly in that software that is guaranteed to be exploitable. It's effectively a remote code execution by design, uh, remote code execution vulnerability by design. As soon as that is ingested into any consumer, whether it's on the developer desktop or another system, it will exploit itself or action, perhaps providing a foothold into the consumer or executing some initial theft of material, key material. Whereas vulnerabilities may be an issue and you need to prioritize it to, to remove that, malicious functionality, malicious code is something that absolutely is guaranteed to be a problem and needs to be prevented from getting into your, your consumed uh, enterprise. That's the general idea behind the le compromise of that legitimate package. And there's multiple different areas where we can prevent that software from getting in. Part of that is around knowing where that open source software library has been built. So there are areas where you can get uh, open source software from a curated maintainer, uh, that they have built that open source software on a secured piece of infrastructure, or you yourself can download the, the source code and build it yourself. Obviously, there's complexities in doing so, but at least it removes some of those secure, the, some of those difficulties. And then when it gets into the internal consumer, put the secured open source library in a secured container repository and always retrieve it from that. So at least you prevent the ingestion right at the start there. So Henrik, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about some of those attack paths. Yes, I think we were mixing up a little bit the order now because you went quite a long way in the mitigations or actions already. Maybe let us jump one slide back, which is giving a little bit more information on the attack surface. And you have mentioned a couple of, let's say, possibilities for attackers already to conduct such supply chain attacks. But I wanted to make clear, first of all, again, how big this attack surface can become. First of all, for known vulnerabilities, it is primarily related to components that end up in a runtime environment, right? But for uh, attacks, for supply chain attacks, where you have those malicious payloads, basically all the components matter that you consume throughout your whole software development lifecycle, right? For all the IDE plugins, all the scripts and so forth, because no matter where in your software development lifecycle you download and use those open source dependencies, those malicious payloads can be executed. All of those components basically have an attack surface that is comprised of the maintainers and the, compute, the contributors, sorry, 
the development machines that those open source maintainers and contributors use, their um, source code management system, their build systems, as well as the distribution infrastructure that you use, or maybe not, in order to consume this open source package. And in order to describe this attack surface more comprehensively, I uh, we built on a taxonomy of attacks on open source software supply chain. So this is a paper that we have co-authored with, with a former colleague from SAP, uh, Pier Giorgio Ladiza, published in 2022, and which is basically a very comprehensive and comprehensible taxonomy. There is an open source uh, repository that allows exploring this attack surface in some interactive way. I have linked it here. It's the Risk Explorer. You find it on our website. And on the right-hand side, you see such a, screen, a screenshot of this interactive attack tree visualization, starting from basically uh, attackers, where from the left to the right, you basically refine the techniques available for attackers to inject such malicious code. And I just put one of the recent examples, I think from last week, where there were some an attack ongoing where the attacker basically impersonated the Depender bot GitHub user in order to create pull requests in the hope they would be accepted by project maintainers believing that this comes from the Pender bot, right? So this is just one of the many techniques in this case to inject it into the sources. But of course, and we have seen news articles on a regular basis, there are other techniques in order to inject malicious code in the build or in the build in the distribution infrastructure like package registries. As John mentioned earlier on, there are different actions. One is to vendor basically the respective open source component to rather than uh, consuming pre-built binary packages to copy over the source code and build it yourself. But this comes with a lot of effort though, but then at the same time, it is helping against all the attacks against build infrastructures and against the distribution infrastructure because you start from the sources, you're not depending on anybody else building and distributing it. Other possibilities are when it comes to consuming binary packages is to use version pinning. So do not, to not automatically update uh, something to the latest version that may be compromised to use log files to extend this pinning also to transitive dependencies. And in all of the cases to verify digest and signatures all the way. An internal registry within your organization gives you additional control about what you consume. You can run additional checks. At this point, this such registries would also be used for storing your own internal artifacts. And last but not least, can also run malware and vulnerability scans. And this last bit is something that you would do in any case, because even if you build your, your dependencies from the sources, as, I, as we have mentioned, those sources could also include attacker contributed code. So no matter how you build it and how you consume it, you can also search for those. All right, and this concludes our light on the second of the top 10 open source risks. So how do we continue? So what's next, right? Look, th this is a group of 10 uh, open source risks, and we really got together as a group of security specialists and put this risk together. But we're really looking at getting additional feedback and additional input from everyone else really looking at getting additional practitioner feedback to review the work and perhaps extend it uh, for future versions of this. There's certainly a lot of additional risk measures that we feel that could be brought to that list, and it'd be good to hear from other people what has worked appropriately from, from their deployments and really improve the work that we've got there based upon open conversation. And... Part of or going forward, what I find very important is to basically find or develop where necessary risk measures to make this a little bit more, yeah, more concrete, if you will, to measure where are we, because 
unless you measure it, you cannot really improve. And the other last point on this slide is about extending the use of program analysis beyond what we have shown before, beyond just vulnerability assessment or vulnerability impact assessment, because um, we at Endo believe that it can support also many of the other, can mitigate and help with many of the other risks, providing update suggestions, discover breaking changes and so forth. And last but not least, we also, John and I wanted to use the opportunity to make a shameless plug for the other work the two of us are doing as part of the open SSF. So together we're working on a high level threat model. The idea behind is basically to model a typical enterprise development environment and then identify all the threats that result from the consumption of open source. And uh, such a threat model, we hope, is a blueprint for organization-specific threat models that take our high-level architecture and refine this and adapt this to their specific environment, which then can be useful for designing countermeasures, uh, performing a gap analysis, where is an enterprise in terms of supply chain security, and last but not least, uh, this will hopefully also serve the open SSF to create a map of what are the different um, threats mitigated and addressed by the many open SSF projects and, it, and initiatives. Right, so this is a shared effort. Uh, so we invite you all to join us uh, in our workgroup meetings and uh, threat modeling workshops to continue this work.